Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Sitting behind me here is a 2014 Chevy Impala 3.6 liter with an interesting drivability concern today that's not setting a check engine light. All right, so just a little backstory on this 3.6 and this Impala. It's got about 140,000 miles on it, and I am now the fourth person to be looking at this vehicle. It's been to three other shops previous and it's had a wide variety of things done to it at this point, all to solve a problem that's not setting a check engine light. So the customer complaint on here is a misfire problem, a stumble, this feeling of a slight phantom misfire on light load situations, idle and deceleration. It's not a under load, heavy acceleration, um, ignition type misfire, something like that. It's a real light, subtle misfire, again, that's not set in the check engine light. So to set the scene a little further, this thing has had a gamut of parts thrown at it, including the throttle body, fuel injectors, spark plugs, the valves have been cleaned. Um, what else has been done? Intake manifold gaskets, coils have been swapped around. Uh, that might be it. My list wasn't exactly um, written out too well here, but I think that's about all that's <laughs> been thrown at this thing. But basically, everything that you would be throwing at a vehicle to chase a misfire problem has already been done on here, and it ends up here today to hopefully get to the bottom of the problem. So I'm going to take you guys along on the process that I performed on this vehicle to reach a conclusion. So for starters, like always, I like to test drive the car and confirm the customer complaint. I do feel a slight misfire. It seems like it's um, just, it's subtle. If you weren't really looking for it, you would probably miss it on here, but the scan tool's picking it up. You can see here that we're showing misfires on cylinders one, three, and five. GMs are gonna run one, three, and five all on bank one. That's gonna be the back bank, the firewall bank on this motor. So we're missing, or we have cylinder misfires recording on one bank. As we jump over to the fuel trims on here, it tells a similar story. We're looking at a fuel trim issue on bank one as well. As you can see there, bank one long-term fuel trims are sitting at a cool negative 14. Remember, uh, fuel trims typically within plus and minus 10% is kind of considered that known good mark. Negative 14 is right outside of that realm. Nothing to be freaking out about yet, but another piece of the puzzle, another part of the story that we're looking at here. It's um, dramatically different though than bank two. Bank two looks beautiful hovering right around the zero line. Bank one, substantially different. So the scan tool and driving the vehicle are telling me this thing's got a misfire and a fuel trim issue on bank one, a rich issue subtracting fuel away for bank one. So what, what do you do next when it's had all these parts thrown at it? I don't, I don't wanna go suggesting more uh, high pressure fuel injectors or you know uh, more spark plugs or those types of things. I'm not gonna assume that they're good, but I'm gonna take a different path of testing to not have to do the hard things first. I, if I don't have to pull this intake manifold off, I don't wanna pull the intake manifold off right now, right? So one of the first tests that I like to do is relative compression. You guys have seen it on videos here before, how to perform that test. There's a link up here to, uh, to grab that video to perform a relative compression test, but here were the results from that test. I have an ignition sink on cylinder two, and as we look at this, I'll, I drop down the, the horizontal bar to kind of get a look at this, and it's not exactly conclusive. I'm not in love with the relative compression test, but I'm also not exactly confident that it's bad at this point either. Uh, we're looking at a full cycle of the engine, you know, the full uh, ignition to ignition event on cylinder two, and maybe three of the cylinders look like they're a little lower on compression, but boy, I would have a hard time selling any sort of expensive job based upon this relative compression test. I'm not in love with it, but I'm also not convinced of what exactly our problem is at this point. So moving on from relative compression, I went to the next easiest thing on here, and that was to take a look at engine vacuum. Again, we're looking at things that are affecting only one bank of the engine, only one side of the engine, half of the engine. So engine vacuum gives us a look at what the entire engine is doing, and this is where I started to find differentiators. So again, it's sinking on ignition two because ignition cylinder two was easy to pull. And you can see here that we have lower peaks on every other cylinder and deeper valleys on every other cylinder. And 
If this were an engine that fired on the same bank one after the other, it wouldn't look like this. GM's 3.6 fires bank to bank, so cylinder one fires, then two on bank two, then three on bank one, then four on bank two, then cylinder five on bank one, then cylinder six on bank two. So we're firing cross bank constantly, giving us a really pretty pattern here that's showing us that we have a vacuum or a breathing issue with our engine manifold vacuum. We have three cylinders that are pulling less of a draw or they're, they're having a not as deep of a vacuum pull and then there's peaks that are higher on three, uh, three pulls as well. So I'm not gonna get into the breathing of the engine and the valves opening and closing and what all that's gonna do. All I wanted to show here is that engine vacuum has an issue. This is the beginning of starting to determine what is happening with this vehicle. We have a problem with the vacuum and as I hooked up the gauge on here, and actually read the gauge in inches of vacuum. At idle, this thing was pulling about 17 or so inches of vacuum, which, I don't know, maybe a little bit low, unless I had a 3.6 sitting right next to me that I could check to tell you that it's supposed to be higher. I'm, I'm not really convinced that 17 is exactly super low, but just from experience, I think I'd like to see it higher than 17. Again, not super conclusive, but looking at it with a pressure transducer, really tells us that there's something wrong with half of this engine. So uh, starting to look at the engine as a whole, and knowing the 3.6 liter, we kind of had to assume that we were gonna get to this point. The RTV on the front cover looks original. Um, it doesn't look like the valve covers have ever been off of this thing. Timing chains were our problem on the 3.6 liter. So that was the next test that I performed. I looked at cam crank correlation again, looking at the difference between where the camshaft is or the camshafts, intake and exhaust, are in time compared to the crankshaft. And the main goal of this test is to confirm or deny if the chain is where it's supposed to be. Is the chain stretched? Is the chain jumped? Has something happened to the timing chain? Which again is super, super common on here. So I went ahead and captured cam crank correlation on bank one, our problem bank. I went with that one first because that is the one that you know our problem is, is happening with. So. There is the zoomed in capture for bank one. Now, if you're curious how to get to this point, um, here's a link to that down in the description of the video. Otherwise, up here on the screen, you'll see the link as well for how to pull this cam crank correlation test. But really what we're looking at here is the missing tooth on the crankshaft wheel um, in blue on our known good pattern. Thank you to the Facebook group, the Automotive Waveforms Facebook group. And more specifically to Justin on sharing this known good pattern on this 12 Traverse 3.6. As we look at that one with the crankshaft in blue and we look at our pattern on the left side with the crankshaft in red, we start to compare where the intake and the exhaust camshaft patterns, where they cross the crankshaft pattern. So green on our trace is going to be the intake camshaft and uh, the opposite on the, the known good. The known good is in the red pattern on the intake cam. But all we want to do is really count the teeth backwards from the missing, the missing tooth on the crankshaft. So on our pattern, we're one, two, three, three teeth back is where the camshaft, almost four teeth back, is where the camshaft signal crosses the crankshaft. As we look at the known good, we're one, two, three, four, just over four, call it four and a half teeth back on the known good. So right away our intake camshaft um, pattern on, on, on our vehicle, the, the crossing of the crankshaft is to the right on the scope, which to the right on the scope is retarded in timing. It's happening later. If it were to the left, it would be advanced. If we look at the exhaust camshaft, we look at our known good and we're one, two, three teeth for our camshaft crossing our crankshaft. If we look at the pattern that was pulled from this 14 Impala, we're one, two, three, four teeth. Again, we're coming up later in time on our camshaft crossing. The exhaust camshaft is crossing the crank camshaft pattern at a later time. Our intake and our exhaust camshafts on here are retarded in timing, they're happening later. What causes retarded timing on a 3.6 liter or really any chain motor for the most part? Timing chain stretch. We're not out a lot here, we're out, um, but about six degrees or, or so. Uh, this 3.6 liter doesn't actually set a cam crank correlation code until just about double digits, that nine, 10 degree mark or so. So this thing is out, 
about that six degree mark, but it's not out far enough to set a check engine light. Now let's look at bank two just because we can. It's really not a huge deal to, to pull that test as well. And here's, so here's bank two, again, the known good pattern on the right side and our pattern on the left side. Uh, green being intake cam on the known good, we're one, two, three, four teeth, almost perfectly centered on that, that fourth tooth there. And on our pattern, we're one, two, three, four teeth back. Maybe a little bit to the right, maybe a little bit retarded on that, but really, it looks really, really, really close. As we look at the um, exhaust cam, we're one, two, three, four, five, just after the sixth tooth on the known good, and we're one, two, three, four, five, six teeth on our pattern as well. So bank two's uh, camshaft crankshaft correlation looks good. Bank one seemed to be slightly retarded, and as you're dealing with retarded timing, it's gonna affect when the intake and the exhaust valves open in relationship to where the piston is traveling inside of the cylinder. That can result in misfire problems, fuel trim issues, and single bank problems. Now we don't know for sure because I'm not able to throw timing chains in this, you know, with a snap of fingers here. Um, it's gonna have to go back to the previous shop where they're gonna talk to the customer and determine what the customer wants to do. But uh, I, I have a really good feeling that fixing the timing chain issue on here, the chain stretch on bank one, correcting that problem will fix this vehicle. Everything leads us to that conclusion. Again, it's gonna be up to the customer if they wanna stick I don't know what, thousands of dollars into this 3.6 to fix a problem that's not setting a check engine light? Eventually it will. Eventually it will set a cam crank correlation as that chain continues to wear and stretch and, sh and, and retard the timing even further. But for right now, no light on, just a slight drivability complaint that probably many owners wouldn't even feel in here. Again, if I wasn't looking for a problem, probably would have never felt it on this engine at all. So, um, that was just the path that I took to determine um, some sort of conclusion on this engine, looking at relative compression, looking at engine vacuum, and looking at cam crank correlation. If you wanna know how to do any of those tests specifically, I have videos for all of those links are down below in the description where I show you how to set up the test, get the lab scope captures, and begin to analyze all of that stuff. So I hope you guys found this video interesting, useful, helpful when diagnosing engines. If you did, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you have not already, making sure to click on that little bell icon so that way you get notified every time we come out with a new video. Also, don't forget to head out to our Facebook page and drop a like on there to stay catching, to stay caught up with uh, all the fun stuff that we're doing here at GoTech. So I really appreciate you guys watching, and as always, happy wrenching, everyone. Thank you.